Good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Aranda with Graybar. I'd like to welcome you to Graybar's G2 Talk presentation this morning on understanding smart machines and how they will shape the future. This talk is part of a webinar series we offer each month for our industrial customers. We have a great discussion lined up for you today, but before we get started, I'd like to cover a couple housekeeping items. First of all, if you're one of the first 50 people who join the presentation, you'll receive a coupon for a free cup of coffee courtesy of Graybar as a thank you for your time today. Also, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box for questions and answers, Q&A. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. We'll address as many questions as possible at the end. Lastly, our G2 talks are all archived on the graybar.com website. You'll be able to view this presentation again or recommend it to others. We're happy today to team up with Schneider Electric. As an electrical distributor, Graybar works alongside Schneider to provide industrial grade products for machine builders and panel builders to help you get your product to market faster. You can visit graybar.com slash industrial to learn more about our industrial solutions. I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Mark Duncan. Mark joined Square D in 1983, which became part of Schneider Electric in 1991. During his career with Schneider, Mark has had the opportunity to contribute to many areas of the business, including product management, project engineering, marketing, and business development, and he currently serves as a market segment manager for the U.S. industry business and resides in Raleigh, North Carolina. So Mark, without further delay, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Greg, and thank you for joining us today for this uh, seminar. We'll, we'll be discussing uh, smart machines, uh, how they work, uh, what they are, uh, how they're important, and what you can expect to see in the future. Uh, I'm actually joining you from uh, San Francisco. I've been attending the uh, Semicon West show here, which is a, the premier show for semiconductor equipment. And uh, certainly that the topic of the day here is definitely not business as usual. And there's a lot of IoT talk uh, dominating all the keynotes and conferences and, and the, even a, a dedicated show floor for IoT. IoT really affects this market in two ways. One is that they've really seen the market in consumer products grow and uh, they are producing the technology that's fueling that. And at the same time, they are manufacturers who are adopting the industrial Internet of Things and it's to their production as well. For our uh, agenda today, we'll have a brief history of automation. Uh, we're going to look at uh, smart plant floor, smart manufacturing, what we can expect uh, for that in the future. And we'll focus on smart machines and technology trends that we see in, in smart machines. We'll finish with opportunities for you, how, how you should react to this uh, technology, uh, how you can implement and what to expect uh, and what to do next. Two buzzwords that I'm sure you're familiar with uh, and have seen, uh, uh, Industry 4.0, and the industrial internet of things. Uh, those are two different things that, that uh, two different concepts that really merged together. Uh, Industry 4.0 was created uh, in Germany. It's a European based approach to smart manufacturing, uh, basically monitoring the, the physical process and creating a kind of a virtual copy of that and, and making decisions between machines and between factories to be more efficient in manufacturing. And IIoT, Industrial Internet of Things, is connecting devices, objects to the internet real time to, uh, to collect data and make decisions from that data. And that's really an enabler for the, for the smart factory. Um, we see the, this uh, IIoT as it's not necessarily a revolution, but, but an evolution of technology. Uh, uh, it had its origins and uh, technologies and functions that were developed uh, by automation suppliers more than 15 years ago. But it now is maturing. We're seeing a lot of technologies come together and global standards starting to mature. 
And we think that it's going to really evolve and grow over the next 15 years, and we'll probably take that long to realize its full potential. Although it's an evolution, nevertheless, the changes to the industry will be uh, far-reaching, and, and they're already starting. The good, the good news is that end users and machine builders can leverage uh, their existing investments in technology and people and take advantage of the new IIoT uh, technology. We see it a little bit different than in the past where it was uh, if we built a new facility or we updated a plant, we would rip and replace equipment. Uh, there's a lot of investment out there, so we see this more as a way to reuse and wrap around the existing equipment. A measured uh, approach will, will drive the evolution towards a smart manufacturing enterprise that will be more efficient, more safe, and uh, sustainable. Cisco predicts that uh, by 2022, the value at, uh, for the industrial Internet of Things will be somewhere around $14.4 trillion, uh, with manufacturing uh, accounting for the largest piece of the pie, 27%, about $4 trillion. That's predicted there in the first graph on the, on the left, as you see, it says, it says factories. Uh, productivity at the same time is going to show gains from 20, 10 to 30%. And you can see that there in the discrete manufacturing like automotive or food and beverage. We're going to see tremendous productivity gains. And uh, how's this happening? It's happening because of a lot of technologies coming together, uh, such as those that, that you see there on the right, um, big data analytics, uh, augmented reality, uh, wireless communication and uh, and cybersecurity, which is going to be key to making this work. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the convergence of IT or information technology and OT operational technology. Uh, those two uh, departments typically don't work together in, inside of a uh, a production facility, but uh, this is going to change. Um, and and really, the bridge is is Ethernet. E Ethernet is the the deployment of Ethernet and wireless connected devices is pulling these two uh, departments together to work together, to collaborate together, to exchange data. And uh, we're seeing that already, where where uh, plant managers uh, are pulling data from IT but it's actually coming from the operations uh, side of the business, and they're able to log in and see how the process is running and what kind of efficiency they're getting. Uh, today, it, it takes more than the IT department to pull all of this technology together. It takes the expertise at the process level, at the operation level. And the real challenge for all of us is how, to, how do we pull all this together? How do we realize the potential? Um, and then... And Intel this week was again predicting that we're going to see 50 billion things connected by 2020, uh, 212 billion sensors uh, collecting and producing 44 zettabytes of data. I had to, to look that up. I didn't know what a zettabyte was, but you guys are familiar with gigabytes and terabytes, uh, 1,024 terabytes or are one petabyte and 1,024 petabytes is an exabyte, and then you get the zettabyte. So it, it's a huge amount of data that, that's coming our way uh, through the Internet of Things. Looking back, uh, we see that in the, the first Industrial Revolution, there was uh, in the 18th century, that was steam-powered. Uh, and then in the 20th century, with the uh, uh, distribution of electricity, uh, we saw an electrical-powered uh, revolution in, in manufacturing. And then the 1970s, with uh, we saw the computer come to the plant floor, uh, and we had a computer-powered uh, industrial revolution. And then now, what we're seeing in in, um, in the last five years and going forward is is uh, an internet or data-powered 
uh, manufacturing revolution with uh, with these uh, systems connected to to cyberspace. So cloud-based uh, uh, manufacturing. Okay, start off with let's let's take a look at how then smart machines come to be a topic of conversation in, in this. Uh, again, I want to remind you that two concepts, uh, Industry 4.0 and then the Industrial Internet of Things, um, both of these initiatives focused on, are focused on manufacturing flexibility, increasing levels of automation, and, and increasing uh, digitization. Um, such evolution requires that we embrace a lot of different technologies and ideas that will have a lot of impact on the OEM and the user. Uh, this will take time. Um, um, the next step in the evolution is is uh, to create smart machines. Uh, smart machine is a, is a collection of smart connected products that, that really maximize efficiency through being more uh, intuitive, more collaborative with its user. Um, and there's really three factors that are uh, that are influencing this development of smart machines. Certainly, the technology that we've talked about. But also consumer expectations. That, um, the release of, of new technology that, such as cell phones and iPads and, and the like that you use at home as, has increased the expectation for machine operators and, and users in the plant to have the same type of technology in front of them to use and to acquire data and training around uh, their production and their, their machines. Um, on the technology side, both innovation and, and lower costs are making uh, the equipment um, uh, less expensive and, and uh, more accessible. And the end user uh, demands are uh, for are really around flexibility, and they're they're really what's driving uh, this. And and we see three distinct operational environments that that. Uh, Will set the stage for uh, for smart manufacturing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about smart manufacturing. Um, there's really, uh, as I said, three uh, areas that that the um, end user is going to benefit uh, in in this uh, age of uh, smart manufacturing. The, the first being um, whoops, the, back. the first being um, better asset management better asset management so de you know when you deploy uh, wireless sensors and, and connect them to the cloud you know doing data analytics and, and you'll be able to improve your processes and they'll they'll make uh, uh, better decisions uh, in the factory. This will this will be uh, more forward-looking decisions than 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 um, than we've had in the past, and um, the the wireless solutions, the cloud solutions, will result in an acceleration of uh, monitoring systems and and preventative maintenance and energy management and so forth. Um, one one area that that will be quite different is is uh, is Predictive maintenance today, you know, when you do predictive maintenance, you're basically looking at at uh, the age of the asset, right? Um, and really, uh, it turns out that only about 18% of assets fail because of age. The other 82% fail because of random patterns, uh, random issues. So instead of monitoring one variable, such as the bearing temperature of, of, or a pressure or a position, We'll, we'll, we'll start doing prescriptive maintenance where we'll monitor multiple variables of an asset and, and use that information to, to create some algorithms and some machine learning that will be more sophisticated and, and we'll have a better, um, better uptime of our equipment because we would have better intelligence about the asset. The second uh, advantage is better process control, better uh, better discrete and, and process control. Next uh, generation systems will allow uh, integration with legacy production and, and uh, 
will will reach out beyond the the actual machine to the to the to the enterprise to the supply chain. Um, there'll be a very tight integration between machines connected to each other, machine to machine communication, uh, machine to user communication. Uh, the this will facilitate much more efficiency and, and uh, uh, profitability in manufacturing. Smart enterprise control can be viewed as, as a medium to long-term trend. It, it's, it's complex to implement. Uh, it'll, it'll require new standards to enable this convergence of IT and OT that we talked about. Um, but we're really going to see a breakdown of these, of these silos that, that we have uh, today. In, in the various aspects of, uh, of, man, of the manufacturing environment. Um, and so we'll take a, a more holistic approach. So today, you know, you, you have your ERP system, you have your production system, your, your product lifecycle management, your supply chain, even your CRM. They're all standalone systems. They'll be connected together in, in a more holistic uh, fashion, and that can increase efficiency um, a, a recent McKinsey study said up to 26% more efficient. And that's what the end users are, are uh, really looking for and wanting to know how to employ IoT because of that. The third uh, advantage is, is really a deeper insight for operators, uh, better informed uh, with more data, more information, real time. Um, and, and the future workers are, are our kids, the, the younger generation, and they're already used to using mobile devices. Uh, so we see more and more mobile devices in in the factory uh, around machines uh, to use uh, uh, to get data access quickly. Um, and this information will be delivered in a, in a real time way that's familiar to them, uh, perhaps through augmented reality, uh, very transparent. Um, and so the, the plant then becomes more user centric and, and less machine centric. Uh, now, uh, today, um, immediate access to information is difficult. About 50% of the time spent on maintenance is finding the information to do the maintenance. So uh, the, the end user wants this information readily available to his uh, to the user of the machine, to the operators. Um, and there's some examples of this today. I mean, uh, if you look at uh, the use of dynamic QR codes, uh, okay, this is a code that's on the, uh, uh, the on the equipment today, a device that um, changes, and you can scan it with your cell phone and then take that information, which is bring you to a page on the Internet and, and give you, uh, readily uh, a diagnostic on the equipment, uh, maybe some instructions of how to, to handle the uh, the issue, uh, a manual with, with information. So that's happening today. Uh, what's also happening today is that there's a company developed a smart uh, hard hat, if you will. You see the gentleman there with his hard hat, uh, where you could see work instructions through a wearable technology, see your repair manual, see operator manual, Maybe some augmented reality uh, as as well to to go in and, and make adjustments on the machine or uh, update the machine uh, much faster than than in the past. So again, three three core advantages for uh, smart manufacturing. And for these three, better asset performance and greater process control and deeper insight for operators. Uh, as a leader in the market, Schneider Electric has already produced some some products that, that address this, like the Altivar process drive, which can monitor the performance of, a, of an asset like a pump or conveyor and give health of the asset uh, over the Internet. Um, we have wireless uh, devices that get, can be set up quickly and and communicate quickly and easily with, without battery uh, in, in an industrial environment. Uh, we have a, a software platform called System Platform, which is a, a very flexible, efficient platform for development, distribution, and management of production uh, data. And um, 
it really bridges this gap between OT and IT already. So we have a, a, uh, a software platform to help help with that. And then I, I mentioned the QR codes uh, for operators. Um, and, and then we also have um, a, a, a wireless pendant station that, that, that can make uh, operator performance much more productive and safer, a single hand operator device. And uh, Smart Glance from On to Wear, which is a, uh, basically getting plant data on your mobile smartphone or tablet uh, to access that instantly in the real time and make decisions quickly. All right, and then <clears throat> let's move on to smart machines. What, what makes a smart machine? Uh, what is it? And, um, and what, what can we do to build one? Simply put, uh, it's a, a device that's better connected, more flexible, more efficient, and safer than, than traditional equipment. Uh, a smart machine can quickly respond to new demands. It's, it's uh, self-aware, and, and, and uh, it's built on, a, as I said earlier, a collection of, of smart connected products uh, to maximize efficiency. It's capable of producing, uh, as we said earlier, predictive and prescriptive maintenance, um, you know, minimizing its, its own um, uh, downtime. Uh, it, it's probably a smaller footprint and, and has a lower total cost of ownership than, than in the past. Um, so let's go a little bit deeper and look at the, the aspect of efficiency. Uh, that means that they're self-aware. Uh, with the use of sensors and and uh, and the knowledge coming from those sensors, uh, a smart machine will be able to monitor its key components, uh, provide relevant information to operators, uh, data consumers. And everybody's going to be a data consumer, right? It's going to be the 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 user in the factory, uh, the management in in the facility. It's going to be also the owner of the machine is going to consume data from it. Uh, externally through remote monitoring. Uh, so the level of machine monitoring is going to enable um, this, this high level of maintenance and help provide uh, uptime. Machines will be uh, using uh, more and more sensors, more and more wired and wireless sensors. Uh, that I saw this week actually uh, this idea of a wireless hub of sensors where the sensors communicate only when they need to to a wireless portal and then that portal uh, will only communicate when necessary back to the machine um, if, if you uh, uh, if you're aware of um, a guy named um, Keith Campbell a, a well-known guy in the automation world he predicts that motors and drives will have electronic nameplates machines will describe their own features through a kind of an electronic passport and allow upper level systems to look down at lower level systems. So kind of like the, the, the following the USB device, you can plug and play machines. The machine will identify itself as, uh, for example, a, a, a wrapping machine or a pump and tell the network it's capable of running at X speed and then communicate, um, with a, with a, very specific structure in the, in the uh, in the plant floor. And data management is another piece that's going to be important. Uh, smart machines will have to have the appropriate level of data, but again, <clears throat> not sharing all the data. Doing some local data uh, analysis before providing data out to the network. Um, and and in the past we've stored data on hard drives, but now we would be storing the data. In, in the cloud, so uh, this this is going to be uh, uh, helpful in making machines more more efficient. Smart machines are safe and secure. Uh, you know, security is going to be a concern, um, and smart machines will provide safety of operators and minimize the risk. Uh, machine builders need to offer a broad option of of safety features uh, such as uh, safety laser scanners and safety cameras. I, I, I saw some new camera technology here this week 
and um, and safety PLC. So the ability to mix all of the safety components together and eventually do safety over the network uh, uh, will be uh, be paramount to to uh, a smart machine. Uh, it needs to be multi-layer, so you're going to have safe hardware, safe software, and then the real safety is in I'm communicating this data out, so I need to have good data services, data security uh, in, in the plant floor. Uh, this week at the, at the show here, there was a, uh, a hackathon, and uh, Intel and Microsoft and Google were challenging people to come hack their their networks uh, as a way to for them to get better at uh, cybersecurity. So uh, it, it, the technology is coming uh, to make uh, machines safe. All right, and, and then uh, machines will be uh, plug and play. End users don't want to do a lot of integration, uh, don't want to spend time on that. They want machines that are modular that that uh, in, in the future we're going to see basically units of manufacturing of one one size one lot uh, very mass customization so machines will have to do multi-purpose uh, functionality uh to meet time to market constraints that are put on them um smart machines will have to work faster um machine builders will have to embrace uh proven reliable Technologies and, and 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 validate their machines quickly with the uh, the end user, uh, so they need to be flexible. And then uh, smart machines will be uh, connected, uh, and then we connected to the broader Ethernet-based network. Uh, they again, the the machines will be a part of this bridge between the IT world and the operations technology world. Um, and they'll be mobile. Uh, machine operators will, will, uh, as I said earlier, be able to access data remotely. Uh, the devices will provide operators with the flexibility to move around the machine and get data uh, and diagnose problems quickly and uh, bring, bring the machine uh, downtime and loss of, uh, of uh, use down uh, dramatically. Um, so the connectivity is is key. All right, so let's take a, a few minutes here, and um, if you see on the screen now, you should see a, a poll. And in your opinion, which one of the features of a smart machine is the is the most important? Uh, take a few minutes and answer that, and we'll have a uh, the results. All right, so just a few more minutes to click your answer. All right, so looks like uh, a lot of you talked about uh, connectivity, uh, efficiency, and safety. Okay, and, and less so for digital mobility and modularity and, and flexibility. So yeah, the, the connectivity is going to be key. Uh, I certainly uh, see that, and that means uh, that we're going to have to eventually have some standards for communication, and we'll talk about a use case of that in in, uh, in just a few minutes. Okay, so what's next in, in, to propel us into smart machines? What 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 needs to evolve and there's four things that that have to happen and uh the, the survey speaks to that as communication and certainly today uh with smart manufacturing uh, a transition is underway to replace field bus protocols with uh, industrial internet uh this outlook suggests that the adoption of industrial internet will help uh, future proof end user facilities uh, Today, I think there's a yeah 66% of 
of uh, uh, new node connections are field bus. Uh, with industrial internet increasing about one to two percent a year, but the move to Ethernet-based communication is, is going to accelerate uh, with uh, IIoT and, and uh, as, as end users begin to embrace industrial Ethernet more and more in, in, in the factory. Um, so this this increased connectivity will will bring about new security issues, and, uh, and uh, we certainly need to build security in at all levels in, in the in the machine and in the factory. And so training and education is going to be really important. Um, machines that provide sim- and simplify the uh, the life uh, of the end user will become differentiators. And, and show a significant opportunity. Uh, so it's going to be important to decide what to communicate, not just how to how to communicate in, in the future. Um, the second uh, barrier uh, really is these fragmented uh, um, standards that we see today. Um, new standards to to are going to arrive and have arri- are arriving to encompass. Uh, uh, the semantics to allow smart machines and smart devices to talk to each other without the need for custom uh, programming. Uh, smart devices and smart machines will have to discover each other and interact automatically without the uh, without the user or operator involved. The development of open standards will provide structure and guidance to to OEMs and end users, helping them to implement. Uh, work processes and leverage the benefits of IoT. So rather than maintaining, managing, and gathering information from numerous systems, the ultimate goal is to create an open platform for communication in in the factory floor and use the cloud to store that information. Integration will evolve. That's certainly a a constraint today and an issue today. but again, the, this integration between IT and OT is critical to achieving the benefits of smart manufacturing. So beyond the factory floor, end users and OEMs need to consider how smart machines will integrate into the wider organization, into the supply chain. Uh, and beyond the hardware integration, there will be software integration will be paramount. And the next step in merging the factory floor with the enterprise. Uh, So we're seeing some new standards of communication coming. New fields of activities are already out there uh, for software-defined networks and uh, and automation uh, communication standards that that will uh, certainly ramp up in the next uh, few years. And then the role of software. Um, the significance of software as an enabler has, has really increased the last few years. In some cases, software replacing hardware and a smart machine. Uh, it, it provides this link from disparate systems enabling interoperability between machines and, and people. Um, so it's the digitization of, of information is, is a is a positive example of software. We we see this, uh, but we also see simulation software really taking off, where uh, you're able to um, design in a collaborative way uh, an automation uh, application uh, in the cloud, having engineers from different locations involved in designing and prototyping and simulating before they ever deploy the system. Uh, and then that same simulation idea can be used for the operators uh, so they can be trained on the system uh, prior to ever uh, uh, um, initializing a machine. They can be trained in, in how to uh, use the system and uh, improve efficiency and safety. Uh, so the focus needs to be on you know real practical solutions and simplification of, of, of uh, use and of the machine. And, uh, and design collaboration needs to be uh, paramount uh, going forward. And data storage. 
data storage will will move to the cloud. Um, the the uh, factory environment is more reluctant to adapt to this technology. The, the OT side, the the IT side's been doing this for years, so this is where that collaboration will need to happen. Uh, with the increasing amounts of production data gathered uh, and, and automated devices and machinery being networked to demand to to store and manage and analyze it will be uh, will grow exponentially. So the cloud uh, storage will will be uh, common, and end users can access that the, as well as the OEM. Uh, and yes, there are concerns about security and firewalls, but uh, there are technologies to overcome that so that machine builders can uh, learn about this and and then they need to provide information from a machine uh, uh, to the analytic system in a, in, in a readable way that that can be uh, can be used to make decisions. So OEMs will that that master this information exchange will will have a competitive advantage in, in the coming years. Okay, opportunities that that uh, that are ahead for us, and um, uh, here's a visual that shows what we've been talking about. Basically, uh, an overview of smart manufacturing, a combination of uh, mobile advancements, mobility, mobile communication, uh, connectivity uh, between machines, between factories, even. Uh, software being innovative and deployed in, in a more uh, uh, prolific way, and uh, Im embedded control is going to allow uh, the development of, of smart machines. As the adoption of IoT and smart machines starts to increase, there are several things that uh, OEMs can do uh, to remain in the forefront. First is leverage new technology to, to improve uh, the efficiency of their equipment, to integrate the equipment on the shop floor, to work with their end users on how that will happen, uh, and to focus on simplifying the, the life of the end user and the operators. Uh, migrating data to the cloud, uh, develop services, and yes, develop services and be a, a solution provider uh, for for their customers. So understanding your core competencies uh, and your customers better than ever, defining where you want to go with uh, with uh, IoT and how you how to share the information. This, this is the the hard part. You're going to probably end up sharing information you don't you may not want to, but uh, it's going to be more transparent uh, going forward. Um, focusing on a, a lifetime service for your equipment, uh, being a solution provider, and being collaborative. Uh, working with new partners, for example, for for with communication technology, for example. So being open-minded is is going to be key. All right, now um, I want to talk about a use case um, that's real and that's happened that, that we were able to uh, help a, a, an end user and their OEMs deploy a, a new system of connected machines. So uh, Tassimo is, uh, is, a, um, is a new coffee brand. Uh, they, they, uh, they have what they call the world of coated coffee so it's a it's a single cup coffee brewer that uses these t disc uh tassimo disc coffee packs and so you can uh get your coffee tea espresso latte cappuccino whatever hot chocolate uh pack and then they have a system called intellibrew so this is a smart coffee machine already right and, it, and so all these discs have barcodes on them and the machine reads the code, measures the water, the temperature, the brew time, makes a perfect cup of any of those drinks that I just described. Uh, but what they wanted to do was to manufacture these discs 
they wanted to have a, a smart uh, approach. They wanted to have a smart factory, and they wanted to have smart machines that provided information about their status, their configuration, their condition, uh, and they wanted these machines to talk to each other. So they had to s- decide on some standardization. And so there's a couple of things they looked at. One was the OPC standard uh, and another one called PACML. And so uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. PACML is a, is a new communication standard for packaging machines or really any kind of uh, discrete machine. And uh, they wanted to have real-time motion uh, with a standard open uh, Ethernet and um, they wanted to be able to do controller controller communication and uh, have a distributed architecture. Um, and so if you look at uh, the production line, uh, it looks something like this. So here's the Tassimo T-Disc production line. You'll see the disc on the left get dropped into a feeder, and then we have a robot that sorts them and inserts them uh, into the sealing and feeling, uh, filling machine. So we're dosing them, uh, and then uh, this is where the T-disc parts meet the coffee, and they get filled, and then they go and are collected and packed, and then put into a flow wrapper, and then cartoned, and then palletized, and then shipped to the warehouse. So <clears throat> in the past, these machines would come from different vendors with different protocols and different uh, uh, PLCs. And so communication and integration was very challenging. But uh, what they decided to do was employ this um, PACML communication based on uh, an ISA standard called S88. And basically, it's a state machine approach to uh, programming your machine, creating up to 17 states that are that are consistent across all the machines, uh, and then uh, communication tags for command, status, and administration. So all of these machines could could arrive at their facility, even though they're for different manufacturers, and they could be easily connected together and integrated and, and communicate seamlessly with one another. And that's what we were able to accomplish uh, for Tassimo. So that that's an example of uh, a future factory um, line uh, using smart machine technology. Okay, so I think we're ready for another poll. Uh, And uh, based on your experience then and the needs of your customers, how critical is the need for smart machines and and smart manufacturing? Is this important or is this... uh, uh, not that significant. I'll give you just a few more minutes if you would. All right, let's see what people are saying. So, uh, very critical, 37%, somewhat important. And so, so this is important, absolutely important topic. Uh, yes, uh, the adoption rates are vary, but uh, as you can see from the use case, it's real. People are, are starting to step into this. Um, and, uh, it's, it's going to be, Uh, critical for our future. Okay, just uh, a little bit about Schneider Electric. If you're not familiar, Schneider Electric is a $30 billion uh, uh, technology provider for an energy management and automation control specialist. And uh, at at Schneider, uh, we focus on um, energy management, automation, and software. And we focus on four key markets, uh, building automation, residential, uh, as well as industrial infrastructure and data centers. Uh, 
set, we we work in markets where 70% of the of the world's energy is consumed. So energy management is, is paramount to us. Um, but uh, as well, we also are uh, uh, one of the leaders in factory automation. Uh, and we've been doing it for a long time. Um, we we actually introduced the first web server in a PLC back in 1996. Uh, we came out with Modbus TCP in 1997 and called that the Transparent Factory and haven't looked back since then. Uh, in 2004, uh, Modbus TCP was submitted to IEC uh, for standardization and um, and then in 2010, uh, there's been a convergence of Modbus, TCP, and Ethernet IP. Uh, so we've been on the forefront of this. Um, certainly, standards are are key, and, and, and standardization can occur, and we're very much into our commitment is to open standards uh, to further uh, this technology forward. Um, you know, we can say that over half of the Ethernet networks out there today use Modbus TCP Ethernet IP. Uh, so the good news is that end users and machine builders can leverage uh, this technology, and it's available uh, even even today. Um, we have a few products that I'll just highlight. Um, the uh, new Modicon 580 uh, EPAC uh, Programmable application controller, uh, uh, one uh, uh, product of the year in 2014, I believe it was. Um, and uh, this is the first ever Ethernet based uh, uh, PLC. It has an Ethernet backplane. This allows third parties to develop modules to use the standard Ethernet protocol and hardware layer. It facilitates IT and OT convergence, uh, as we have been talking about. And was the first PLC to really play in the uh, industry uh, 4.0 architecture. Uh, it is cyber secure. I think it's Achilles 3 uh, certified. Um, so it's a great product for this uh, evolution. Ethernet uh, is 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 prevalent, and uh, we're supporting that with this PLC. Uh, Eurotherm online services. So this is a cloud-based uh, uh, technology and QR code technology to store critical information from our Eurotherm uh, temperature controllers, and you can retrieve that quickly through the cloud. Um, Altivar process we've already talked about. Uh, this is our drive that um, will uh, allow easily to be uh, uh, communicated with and, and send information over the uh, over the web uh, with dynamic QR codes to quickly troubleshoot a failed drive and get it back online in the shortest amount of time. And another product that's not on here is our UPS system. So uh, uh, power backup is going to be uh, very important in the Internet of Things, and we have a complete uh, leading offer of that in the uh, in the industry. Okay, you can learn more about smart machines by going and uh, downloading our uh, white paper uh, on our website, uh, schneiderelectric.us backslash smart machines. Uh, you can also, I believe, if you chat or email a uh, white paper, we can uh, get a copy of that to you directly. We also have some yeah, other Mark, uh, resources. Please. Yep. <laughs> yeah, thanks. If, if anyone wants that white paper, they can just type in the Q&A box. Just type in white paper, oh. and we will email that to them. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Greg. So, yes, uh, be sure to do that. We'll get the white paper to you. Um, there's also a white paper on uh, on the smart enterprise as well as smart machines. Um, and then, so if you've got questions, you can contact me uh, for sure. Uh, and there is also a blog uh, that Schneider has on the Internet of Things uh, uh, that is kept uh, uh, up to date with informative information on this subject. So I want to thank everyone for their attention and uh, time, and I think now I'll turn it back over to Greg and uh, see if we have any uh, questions. Yeah, thanks, Mark. That was a great presentation. And uh, like Mark said, we're ready to take some questions. So if you have a question, feel free to enter it in the Q&A box and send it my way. And 
Oh, we'll ask it to Mark. So, Mark, we do have a few in the queue here. So I'll go ahead and start okay. off. So how do you how do you see the new automation standards evolving from IIoT? Right. So uh, that's a great question. And uh, uh, you know, in the past, um, when we when we had the uh, field bus uh, evolution, it became the field bus wars, right, between uh, between us suppliers. So we we see this as a different approach this time around. Um, we see already that uh, Ethernet has become the backbone of industrial automation, and the Internet protocol is really the, the, the plumbing, if you will, for cloud computing and, and, and that now being used in the industrial environment. Uh, the, the major industrial protocol uh, has been upgraded. I think we're at IPv6. Uh, so this is a safe, secure Internet protocol. That will be uh, that will be used. Uh, there are other things happening. The uh, I talked about the OPC UA, which is a client for uh, exchanging data between uh, devices, and um, and that's going to continue to uh, to grow. Uh, the use of OPC uh, UA. To, to really put a client in your smart device and then allow that to communicate with uh, uh, with other software from Microsoft or SAP or Oracle or, or, or uh, others. Uh, programming standards, um, you know, Open uh, PLC, PLC Open is is out there with 23 plus uh, function blocks that are an extension to the IC 61131 programming. So I really see uh, open programming and open uh, function blocks. Uh, we talked about uh, the use cases of uh, PacML. PacML, again, was this adoption from ISA 88. Uh, standards take a long time. So, uh, so the ISA 88 standard was for batch control. And, and uh, so the, the guys in the packaging machinery world went to them and said, hey, we want to adopt a similar standard for uh, packaging machinery. And uh, they were able to piggyback on what was already been done in, in the batch uh, industry, batch processing. And so now what I'm seeing is uh, other segments like material handling market is saying, well, maybe we don't need to create something different from packaging machine language, PACML. So I think we're going to see more convergence on, on standards. Uh, I think uh, I think there's a lot of collaboration already out there. There's a lot of precedent. For example, the safety standards that, that have already been adopted globally that came out of Europe for, uh, for machine safety. I think there's a lot of groundswell to have communication standards going forward. Um, so hope that answers the question. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, here's the next one. Uh, what types of processes or machines represent the best opportunity to leverage IIoT? Okay. Um, well, uh, I think what we see and what we hear a lot is uh, the uh, supply chain. Uh, is going to be important. So, so uh, I think there was a recent survey uh, put out that answered this question, and and uh, supply chain uh, connectivity uh, was, you know, the shipping, the logistics, the transportation, the the material uh, procurement to the factory and then to the machine uh, will will be an area that has to be addressed because we want to get, as we saw in the TASIMO uh, application there, we want to make sure that we are have material uh, on hand at the right time. We don't want to have inventory. Uh, we want we want to supply the warehouse with product quickly, so, so distribution centers and warehousing will be uh, uh, at the forefront. Um, and then I think... Uh, down in, in assembly, manufacturing assembly, assembly of product. Um, again, there's going to be mass customization. Uh, you know, we're going to make uh, everybody's product personal uh, 
uh, with exactly what they want, and, and we're going to ship it the same day. So assembly has got to be nimble and fast and, and, and local. Uh, I think a lot of manufacturing is going to move back to the U.S. because of this, because of mass uh, customization, where we assemble the product uh, in the geography that it's sold in. Uh, I think packaging, packaging machinery uh, definitely uh, is going to continue to be a market to get into. Uh, as you know, when you go to the grocery store, you see all kinds of different consumer packages uh, you know, and that has evolved and will continue. Uh, and, and the same thing for, uh, packaging of, um, of industrial goods. Uh, I think that's evolving. So, uh, the other thing we didn't talk about was additive manufacturing. So, uh, the, the 3D printing is starting to bear fruit and, and become more of a production than just a, a prototyping tool. Uh, so I think that's another area, fabrication, uh, stamping, um, injection molding, uh, those types of things as well. So uh, I would kind of put them in that order, going from logistics into uh, into um, the different uh, uh, assembly, manufacturing, uh, machine builder type markets. Okay, great. We are about out of time. Let's see one more question real fast. Um, what are some of the end user demands that will drive smart machine development? Okay, so the the end users are again all about uh, uh, mass customization. Uh, they they really um, are focusing on how how do I build my product uh, faster uh, and and how do I do it uh, quickly? Uh, how do I have high availability of my production equipment? Uh, I don't want my machines to have any downtime. Uh, I want to be able to trace uh, my my goods. There, there, there's some new standards around uh, food and beverage for track and trace that that are driving this, and I imagine will come from from all products eventually to trace the goods throughout the the um, purchasing cycle and maybe the use cycle. Um, so improved asset uh, utilization and planning, lowering the cost of ownership. Uh, may, many end users I'm hearing now don't want to own the equipment. They may lease it and then you would provide service of, of the equipment uh, and, and a leasing option rather than purchasing. <coughs> so, and then, uh, you know, the, the improvement of product quality, of course, and and the uh, impact on the environment. So uh, energy energy uh, usage is going to be, uh, there's a new ISO standard for energy use, 50,001, that's going to impact how much energy my machine is using is going to be key. Um, and then, uh, again, this immediate access to information that, that you know, 50% of the maintenance today spent on searching for information. That's got to that's going to have to end. It's going to have to be readily available. So uh, I think all of those things are driving uh, the end users to to use IoT uh, and apply it. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. Well, we've got just about a minute left here, so we'll just go ahead and wrap this up. I want to remind everybody again to type in white paper in the Q&A if they'd like us to, to deliver that white paper to them. And, Mark, I wanted to thank you. Thanks for your time again today. It was a great presentation. And uh, everyone on the call, thanks for your time as well. I want to remind you that you can watch this presentation again. Uh, it'll be archived on uh, graber.com if, if you want to see it again or share it with your coworkers. So thanks again for your time, and we hope you'll see you next time, next month, for our next G2 talk. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day.